Once upon a time, there was an abundant blue fish that was sought after by commercial and sports fishermen alike. It lived in the Great Lakes of North America, and in particular, in the Lower Great Lakes, and especially in Lake Erie, although it also had a presence in Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, and the rivers between. This fish was so abundant and so important that in some years it made up half the catch of Lake Erie, but then it suddenly disappeared. This could be the mysterious case of the missing blue fish. What happened to this fish? We'll consider the history of the case, we'll consider the fisherman's perspective, we'll consider the scientist's perspective, and then we'll speculate wildly because although certain facts are known, many aspects of the case remain unsolved, and there'll be some surprises along the way. If you get any benefits from this video, please consider liking and subscribing. The fish I'm talking about was given many names through its range and through time. The most frequently used names were blue pike, blue walleye, or blue pickerel. And in the past, most fishermen called it blue pike, but I'll be calling it blue walleye, and in a moment, I'll explain why. Let's call it the blue mystery fish for now. The blue mystery fish has got a spiny dorsal fin in the middle of its back, it's got a rather unique opaque glassy eye, which is used to see in dim lighting conditions, and it's got the fin arrangement and the body proportions that you see here. Pike and pickerel have got an elongate body form. They lack the spiny dorsal fin in the middle of their back. They lack the opaque glassy eye, and they've got a different a fin arrangement and a different general body shape than the blue mystery fish. Plus, they both belong to the pike family. Members of the perch family have got a similar spiny dorsal fin in the middle of their back. They've got similar fins and body proportions to the blue mystery fish. And the yellow walleye in particular has got the same spiny dorsal fin in the middle of its back. It's got the same opaque glossy eye. And it's got the same fin arrangement and body proportions as the blue mystery fish. The blue mystery fish is simply the blue version of the yellow walleye. And so I'll be calling it the blue walleye. Scientists and most modern fishermen agree with the name blue walleye. More on that later. In terms of the history of blue walleye, between 1885 and 1962, over a billion pounds were caught. Between 1915 and 1958, the harvest averaged 12.7 million pounds per year, with a range between 2 and 26 million pounds per year, which is a very wide range. In 1959, only 79,000 pounds were caught, a fraction of the normal harvest. In the early 1960s, the fish were rarely seen, and by 1983, blue walleye had been declared extinct. Fishermen are observant outdoorsy people, many of whom had close contact with blue walleyes. According to fishermen, blue walleyes were steely gray-blue or dark gray-blue, smaller on average than yellow walleyes, a deep water fish, with slightly larger eyes higher on the head, and other traits that I will mention later. Whatever they called them, fishermen considered blue walleye to be a different species from yellow walleye. They also described hybrids between the two of them, which they called greys, jumbos, or mules. Greys in reference to the intermediate color between the two, jumbos in reference to the fact that hybrids are often larger than expected, and mules in reference to the idea that a horse mated to a donkey results in a hybrid offspring, a mule. Scientists also initially considered yellow walleye and blue walleye to be different species. The scientific name of yellow walleye is Sander, the genus name, and Vitreus, the species name, in reference to its glossy eye. Hobbes, in 1926, described blue walleye as Sander, the same genus name, in other words closely related, but with a different species name, Glaucus, in reference to its blue color. In 1981, Troutman gave yellow walleye and blue walleye the same scientific name, so he thought they were the same species. But he thought that blue walleye was a subspecies of yellow walleye, so he took the word glaucus and moved it to the subspecies position, Sander vitreus glaucus. This necessitated that yellow walleye should have a subspecies name too, so Sander vitreus vitreus, and it remained that way for a while. In 2014, Haponsky and Stepien did a massive study involving the genetics and morphometrics, in other words, body proportions and characteristics, of 1,181 yellow walleyes and blue walleyes. And they came to the conclusion that they're not a separate species or subspecies. So look at the names above, both considered to be Sander vitreus, the same genus and species. But in recognition of the different color of blue walleyes, they gave them a variety name, 
Glaucus. So think about that. A red delicious apple and a green Granny Smith apple are both apples, same genus and species, but in recognition of their slightly different traits, they're different varieties of apples. Let's take a moment to consider other animals that occur in different distinctive colors or forms. We refer to them as being different morphs, phases, or varieties. For example, red foxes can occur in the red morpher phase, the cross morpher phase, or the silver morpher phase, and all three could come from the same litter. The gray squirrel can occur in the gray morpher phase or the black morpher phase, and both could come from the same litter. By the way, black squirrels have an advantage in cities because their black color helps drivers to miss them, while gray squirrels have an advantage in the wild because their gray color blends better with tree bark and helps them to avoid predators. So, it shouldn't surprise us that walleyes could occur in different colors. Blue walleyes lived in deeper, darker waters where it was advantageous to be blue instead of yellow. Blue walleyes and yellow walleyes lived in different habitats, and their color differences were maintained by being in somewhat different gene pools. Variety would be a good word to describe these two, and that is the word that Haponsky and Stepian chose. Now I've got my thinking hat on, because I'm going to start speculating like crazy as we move ahead. Stick with me on this. Red hair and pale skin were common among the Vikings, probably because it helped them to survive long, cold northern winters where there was little sunlight to help them produce vitamin D. They left their genes in Scotland, the country with more red-haired people than anywhere else on Earth. Some of the dancers in the picture are wearing wigs, but it's a cliché that Scottish dancers would be red-haired. The genes that produce red hair are recessive and would be covered up by matings with dark-haired people. However, there will always be red hair in Scotland as long as there are plenty of red-haired people mating with other red-haired people. Does anything I've just told you apply in any way to the situation in walleyes? There was a blue phase that probably had a distinct advantage in deep water situations. So recall, no species has gone extinct, only a variety of that species, and the genes that code for blue are probably still in that larger gene pool, just waiting for an opportunity to express themselves. Well, let's put those ideas aside for a moment and think about what happened to the blue walleye. Was it overfishing? Well, the fishery was not well managed in those days, and the fishermen pursued the walleye until they were gone. Was it pollution and the dead zone? Well, the lake was considered a dead lake in those days, and the dead zone must have been in full swing. If you'd like to find out more about the dead zone of Lake Erie, see my video on that topic, and I'll make it available at the end of this video. Was it that a new predator had been introduced to the Great Lakes? Well, rainbow smelt and alewives had been introduced, and they're known to devour walleye fry. Was it about hybridization and assimilation? Well, all the walleye populations were decreased at that time, but the yellow populations were more abundant and less dependent on deep water. As separate breeding ranges collapsed, the remaining blue walleye would have been incorporated into the yellow walleye population. Remember that hybrids were seen. Certainly all of these factors combined would have been a devastating pressure on the blue walleye population. More about that later. Did anyone try to prevent their extinction? Well, there were some attempts to stalk walleye fry into Lake Erie, like this one in 1969, but it failed because the problems were still in place. There are rumors that fry were taken and put into other secret lakes to be returned one day. I'll put some reference to that below the video. If you know anything, please tell me in the comments. And is it possible that some of them are somewhere in the Great Lakes, like the Deepwater Sculpin? More about that in a minute. Do creatures ever come back from extinction? Well, in theory, no. But if you look up the extinction date for blue walleye, you'll see a number of dates listed, such as 1970, 1975, and 1983. Were these just differences in opinion by different authorities, or did the blue walleye come back from extinction several times when subsequent fish were caught? Here are the dates listed for the last blue walleye caught. Did the extinction dates need to be moved back every time another last blue walleye was caught? If I find out anything else about this, I'll leave info in the more area beneath this video. If you know anything about it, please tell me in the comments section. The poster creature for coming back from extinction is the coelacanth, genus Latimeria. The coelacanth was widely distributed in marine and freshwater habitats for millions of years. We have fossils dating from 410 million years before present. That's the Devonian period, way before dinosaurs. The last fossils date from 66 million years before present. That's the Cretaceous period that spelt the end for dinosaurs and many other creatures. So scientists thought the coelacanths were extinct. But in 1938, Marjorie Courtney Latimer, the curator of a museum, 
saw a coelacanth at a fish market in East Africa and knew what it was. The locals, of course, knew all about this fish. Above my head, you can see a picture of a coelacanth taken by daylight and another one taken by night. It was a deep water marine fish living east of Africa, and that's how it had escaped scientific attention until then. It was named Latimeria cholumnae in honor of Marjorie Courtney Latimer. Then in 1998, a second species christened Latimeria menadensis was found near Indonesia. Much more could be said about coelacanths, but I'm just making the point that after millions and millions of years of apparently being extinct, they're back. Have blue walleyes been seen since extinction? Well, in Lake Erie, hybrids have been captured, meaning that blue walleye genes are present, only they're being covered up or partly covered up by yellow walleye traits. And, in Ontario, Quebec, and some northern states, blue-colored walleye are being captured by fishermen. Blues are back, people are saying. These are walleye, and they're blue. But they're too big to be blue walleyes. They have white on their anal and caudal fins like yellow walleyes, and their eyes are the size of yellow walleye eyes. What do scientists think? Dr. Wayne Schaefer and others found that these fish are regular walleyes that lack the yellow coloration, and that walleyes living in clear northern lakes can secrete a protein called sandrocyanin in their mucus that protects them from UV light. The mucus looks blue on fish that lack yellow color and green on fish that have yellow color. The good news is that walleyes are adaptable and that you can catch blue-colored walleyes, but they're not the real capital B blue walleyes of Lake Erie. How can you tell? Well, the blue mucus can be scraped off the scales, leaving you with a non-blue fish. I'll be calling them blue-colored walleyes. Can Lake Erie blue walleyes return? In terms of past problems, overfishing isn't a problem anymore. Fisheries are much better managed and regulated these days. Pollution and the dead zone are much improved over what they were in the 60s when these fish disappeared. In terms of hybridization and assimilation, we know that blue walleye genes are in the population. Perhaps these genes will have a chance to express themselves as deepwater habitats are fully recovered. Yes, there are invasive species in the lake, but that's only one problem instead of four for the walleye to deal with, and fisheries managers are better at dealing with invasive species these days. The question is, given time and with fewer obstacles, could blue walleyes return to Lake Erie? After all that speculation, let's review the facts of the case. The common name of the fish is blue walleye. The scientific name is Sandrovitreus, nothing more. The relationship to yellow walleye is a variety of yellow walleye. The reasons for extinction are known, and the problems of Lake Erie are now largely solved. In terms of the future, there are three theoretical possibilities. There might still be some in the Great Lakes, although that's a long shot. They might be restocked from secret lakes if those rumors are true. But for sure, there are blue genes in the population, and they would thrive in deep water. It's easier to sneak up on prey and avoid predators if you're a blue fish instead of a yellow one in deep water. Walleyes have a wide distribution, a diverse gene pool, and healthy populations. We have blue-colored walleyes that we can catch right now. And we have abundant, adaptable populations of yellow walleyes. Who knows what the future may hold? As the story of walleyes continues to unfold, let's enjoy and protect the yellow walleyes we have. Please share this video with any friends who are interested in fishing, blue walleyes, Lake Erie, evolution, or the dead zone. If you're interested in environmental science, I have a highly rated course at Udemy called Everyone's World, What You Need to Know About Your Environment. The link is in the description below. See you next video.